Guild Wars 2, a free-to-play MMORPG set in the fantasy world of Tyria, released a universal acclaim back in 2012, and since has marched on with success with three major expansions for the game, with the most recent being the 2022 released End of Dragons. Following the game's recent 10-year anniversary, and now with its Steam release, today we take a deep dive to see what the game has to offer nearly a decade after release, on a first impressions journey like no other, through the entirety of the released content from 2012 to present day exploring its world and getting to know some of its inhabitants in this epic journey, with some already so excited they forgot for a moment that they even have legs. Okay. My name's Mitch Mannix, and this is an adventure looking into Guild Wars 2, front to back. As always, our journey begins with the character creator, where Guild Wars 2 sports a fairly middling amount of customization options when compared to its competitors. One thing that is clear right off the bat is how interesting its playable races are. The powerful looking char bringing up PTSD from a certain ocean based survival game, the Silvari for anyone looking to cosplay as anime belt sprout, and of course the far less exotic human that is so inclined you can customize to take on the world's evil as a giant armored baby. But none of these races will cut it. As for this grand adventure, we will need a true legend. And with that, I proudly introduce the hero of this story Disco Gizmo, the most revered of the Azura race, a necromancer armed with a deadly combination of disco and pure evil. With our selections confirmed, Guild Wars 2 sets up the starter zone and our journey with a cutscene showcasing not only its unique art style, but also early glimpses into the character within its narrative. Whatever the imbeciles outside the city have broken, I'll fix and make my name doing so. Taking our first steps into the world, we are thrust into the character story and tasked with controlling some defective technology that the Azura race pride themselves on crafting, immediately enhanced by the game's spoken dialogue even for our pal Gizmo. Zoja's rarely wrong. Don't tell her I said rarely, by the way. Okay, his voice sounds very well put together. I was expecting something more like... <laughs> yep, that's it. It transpires that the detestable group The Inquest is to blame for the chaos after tampering with the golems, and Disco Gizmo wastes no time in tracking down the Inquest prototype at the heart of the problem to take it down using the game's highly mobile flavor of tab-targeting combat, with dodge rolling to avoid attacks and certain skill buffs for flanking an enemy. On the subject of our pint-sized necro, what stood out for me immediately during this was how fluid and well-crafted the animations for playable characters are, the running, dodging and jumping movement doing well at bolstering the game's visual experience so far after release. And they are all dead. With the initial story missions concluded, we set about exploring the starter zone and getting involved in its opportunities for gear and XP. An experience for me at least that was incredibly enjoyable. Guild Wars 2, rather than drip feeding the same drawn out fetch quests as a single mode of early leveling, presents the player with a number of options, even in its first hour. I began helping one of the scientists with their experiments in a more traditional early quest format, then spotted a marker atop a nearby building and worked my way through a jumping puzzle up to it for more experience and a great look at the land, followed by an NPC actually coming up and getting my attention. Maybe you recruiting and escorting me to a now newly available public event within the starting zone for even more rewards, all leading to a very immersive MMO experience early on, exploring the land for points of interest and visitors while meeting and working alongside the game's inhabitants, with some clearly not being able to contain their laughter at the sight of Gizmo's ears migrating into his amazing hairdo whenever he gets excited. Journeying further into the game's tarnished coast continent, we stumble upon more of the Azura's captivating settlements and stop off to grab some supplies. While working up the side of a building to grab yet another vista, a whole crowd of players can be seen stampeding past, and without a second thought the decision is made to join in whatever shenanigans is occurring, taking Gizmo on a seamlessly transitioning chain of world events, requiring our newly joined band of adventurers to complete a number of objectives before marching and gliding down to the next all culminating in a boss fight, with Gizmo unfortunately too busy staring at his map to find out where he had ended up to participate in. Frog legs, anyone? No? All right, then it's best we depart. It may not seem like a lot, but having little quips from the NPCs like that, whilst working through the world's events, really places them within the game's world, and makes the experience feel less like simply jumping on a train for some quick XP, and more like actual events playing out across the game's landscapes. Oh, and of course, Giz had to go back and get that visitor for a good look at the zone. With a number of levels obtained, and for some reason pretending like he had just won an Academy Award, I'd like to thank my crew and my college instructors. We return to our compatriots to continue the story, getting a chance to meet more of the game's characters, and to get another flashback to a former terrifying adversary. Whoa! 
Oh, Jesus, calm down! Soon after following the story, Gizmo is released into the wider world, getting a look at some of the truly awe-inspiring design of Guild Wars 2's largest cities and player hubs, visiting Ratu Sum for a chance to kick off the professions and explore the city's great use of verticality. <laughs> as well as a little later the grand city of Lion's Arch, a truly amazing location, brimming with character and the ingenious idea to provide roller skates to the city's guard for quick deployment to duties. The game's story missions play out in chapters every 10 levels, with the idea being exploring the land and exploiting the various opportunities for experience in between. After taking in the sights of Lion's Arch, I thought about putting the game to the test when it comes to having freedom when leveling so decided instead of going just north of my previous leveling zone to instead make the journey all the way over to Snowden's Drifts, one of the other level 15 to 25 zones, across the land but located much further away from my Azura beginnings. Not just that, but I decided to go on foot instead of locating what I imagine would be a quick portal to a location nearby, partially due to wanting to have an MMO exploration feeling and partially because I am an idiot with the latter being confirmed almost immediately, as while wandering through one of the higher level zones in between me and my destination, I somehow managed to get set up in a deadly ambush by a small child. Damn you, cricket! But the world would have to throw more than that at Disco Gizmo before he gives up, and with a bit of luck, a very kind roaming player, and with some deduction, I made it to the snow-tipped slopes of the Snowden Drifts, venturing out, leveling up, and trying not to get mowed down by some particularly speedy player mounts. Now fully released out into the open world, a whole host of activities available to keep things varied and interesting as I explored and leveled, I couldn't help but feel almost unable to process why it had taken me so long to really experience Guild Wars 2. When it comes to leveling specifically, I personally find that within a great experience something is almost always sacrificed. What is incredibly impressive is that Guild Wars 2 manages to keep things so interesting, injecting zones with group events seamlessly flowing into each other with completionist and exploration based activities while at the same time keeping an entertaining and personal feeling narrative interweaving it all together. Who is it? Oh, okay. Uh, yep. Oh, oh, oh my god! Throw a f***ing disco ball at it! And you too can help cleanse the land of impromptu oversized arachnids by dropping a like on the video if you enjoy it and letting me know your thoughts down in the comments. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for a whole host more RPG greatness. It's free and really helps out small YouTubers like me. Since we had breezed past level 10, we unlocked the ability to swap between two sets of weapons during combat. For those that are not aware, Guild Wars 2 grants the player a set of abilities based on the current weapon equipped. For example, Gizmo's knife when held in the main hand grants access to health recovery and necromancer abilities. In contrast to his staff abilities, they have more of a focus on area of effect attacks. Not every class can use every weapon, but that doesn't stop the game in providing a huge range in terms of builds and playstyles especially when coupled with the class abilities. Bar swapping will be familiar to anyone who has played the Elder Scrolls Online. Guild Wars did it first. Indeed, and adds yet another layer to its deep and satisfying combat mechanics. With the plan in place to make a voyage to a wayward zone once we had outleveled the current, we set about working our way through the levels, with the mind to explore as much of the land as possible in the process, making sure to make a trip back each 10 levels to continue the personal storyline, leading to my first experience with the game's first person camera feature. Oh, cool, you can go first person. Yes, look, I go first. We will never speak of this again. Upon reaching level 40, the game's first dungeons were unlocked, and Gizmo leaving no stone unturned, rounded up a group using the game's party finder tools. Dungeons are available in two difficulty modes, story and explorable, with the latter available after completing the story mode option, and cleverly covers the aftermath of the story mode featuring branching paths to take, increased difficulty, and currency to purchase unique armor and weapons modeled according to the theme of the dungeon. The dungeons were great for the most part, with some amazing looking locations, good lengths, and rewards both in XP and gear to justify seeking them out. The only real downside comes when attempting a first playthrough with the mind to play out all the cutscenes covering the story of the instance. In my experience, there wasn't exactly a huge number of groups being formed for the dungeon runs, so I encountered a bit of a mixed bag if players would hang around for first timers to enjoy the story, or steamroll ahead clearing most of it by themselves, even when forming a group with a story focus stated. I can't help but wish that the game featured more than the 9 included, but as a whole, the dungeons were yet another example of Guild Wars 2 including another staple of a great MMORPG and doing it well. With yet another activity to keep us busy, it was on through the levels venturing across the land every level range, picking up hero points to spend on abilities and stat points, 
which are given out after completing their respective short open world challenges, while taking time to dive back into the story, which continue to expand in scale, as well as its cast of interesting characters. Oh, and oh my god, that is disturbing. My journey taking me across snowy fields to enchanted forests, dank swamps to mechanical cities, whilst constantly jumping in and out of clearing content solo and with others. I can't express how much of a breath of fresh air it was, leveling in this game. With so much variety in its gameplay, some truly outstanding environmental design complemented beautifully by the game's soundtrack and ambient sounds that allow the player to really sink into its experience and to get that feeling of escapism within the game's world that I personally find more and more in short supply. You sir are just too fabulous to die. After finally reaching the base game cap of 80, it was time to grab some epic gear upgrades, expand into my class specialization, Reaper, as well of course kit Gizmo out with a heart-stopping new drip, ready to dive into some of the game's more late-game orientated offerings. Raiding was first up. After making a trip to the Aerodrome, a location within Lion's Arch specifically used for players looking for groups, Raiding being split into two channels, one for training and one for experienced players, I got a chance to see what it has to offer, and to my delight found that the game really doesn't pull any punches with its raiding content, keeping things challenging to maximize that sense of achievement from the late-game outings. Next up was a game mode that some state as being Guild Wars 2's finest accomplishment, that being its truly massive world versus world PvP game mode, blending both player versus player and player versus environment elements, besieging keeps and towers with siege equipment, battling over resource camps, and completing PvE type content to level up in the world rank, separate from the character rank, for a range of rewards. As far as endgame activities go, I can see this mode adding endless amounts of hours to those that get a kick out of this type of large-scale warfare, especially with such huge and diverse maps on offer. One thing I will recommend though for anyone looking to jump in would be to get a mount first, as for more times than not, poor Gizmo here was left in the dust as his allies marched into battle. After experiencing the leveling and offerings of the base game, I'm incredibly impressed that at nearly every turn, Guild Wars 2's base game handed me an experience that felt worthwhile, incredibly entertaining, and rich with features and atmosphere. I'm always mindful to look out for elements where a game doesn't quite deliver to give the best report possible, but for content that's now over 10 years old, it's impressive that it has the ability to consistently provide such a great experience across the board. And that's without even mentioning that the game doesn't have any enforced subscription model or as far as I could see isn't littered with pay to win microtransactions. If you want one of the best leveling playgrounds to roam around with friends for PvP or PvE, this game nails that. If you're a completionist with a thirst to check every cliff edge and find every hidden away location, this game will not only give you that in insane amounts, but also reward you massively for doing it. Which is an important point, that so many options for leveling especially give out worthwhile amounts of experience, not leading to players feeling forced to pick one or the other, so truly set out to be able to do what they want to do. Of course, the game has its shortcomings such as its dated visuals that I'm sure will turn away those that have justifiably become more accustomed to the more visually appealing contemporary offerings. The lack of player housing and its crafting that although ticking all the boxes by most standards, does lack the more advanced dynamics that games such as Final Fantasy XIV have brought to the table with their profession systems. After such a great initial experience, I was beginning to get truly excited for what awaited us next, and after Gizmo enjoyed some well-earned relaxation, it was on to the dark depths of the first expansion dangerous jungle, beginning with Guild Wars 2's Living World Season 1. The Living World being further purchasable story-driven content to bridge the gap in between expansions, providing a number of hours worth of primarily instance-based content, taking the player to areas not previously covered in the main plotline, as well as boss battles. Well, the crowd loves it, for good reason. That is a performance to beat in the floor final and some nice rewards following completion. The areas covered in the Living World Season content yet again showcasing the great looking diversity and design of Guild Wars 2's environments, and featuring yet more great storytelling. With the stage now set, Gizmo arms himself for the upcoming challenges, by crafting himself a new main weapon, and clearing out any unwanted and hilariously named unneeded items, and sets his sights on the new terror marauding over the lands, beginning by battling his way to the entrance of the thick forest lair of the jungle elder dragon. Bring us back a dragon We've got to... Challenge accepted, with a short introductory mission playing out before we are thrown into the main event.
first stepping into the expansion, what is overwhelming is the sheer scale of the areas and the action playing out within. With massive crashed airships brought down by the jungle's malevolence, tangled within its oppressive environment. Gizmo quickly sets to working through the expansion's main storyline, which is shifted from a more dialogue-focused conversation system of the base game to opting to play out dialogue on the move, which although does feel a little less intimate for each character, does help to keep the pace of delivering the story whilst the action plays out, showcased here meeting some of the locals in a tribe of highly suspicious-looking frogs. Okay, that might have something to do with it. What the hell is even that? Battling on through the story, taking time in between to work on leveling up the expansion's unique masteries, which include a number of ways to traverse the harsh landscapes presented in the Heart of Thorns expansion, including access to a glider, using mushrooms to boost up higher, and unlocking a whole system of tunnel networks to access previously inaccessible areas. Is that Pocket Raptor? Ah, oh, look at him! Look at his little arms! Oh, did, oh Jesus! Oh, he's got the posse on me! Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I want to send a bunch of arms! They're the best arms, the strongest of arms! Okay, now I officially know how that geezer in Jurassic Park felt. The Heart of Thorn zones are indicative of the dense forest environments it looks to emulate, with three floors of dense jungle explorable areas to each zone, all filled with vistas, hero challenges, and of course the game's open world events playing out. Guild Wars 2 again opting for a format that gives its players the opportunity to really get to explore its zones and understand some of its inner workings, with story chapters requiring a particular ability to unlock to progress, avoiding the sometimes all too fleeting rush through the zone when focusing solely on the story-driven content. When it comes to the zones of Heart of Thorns themselves, the highly dense thick forests and yet more incredibly well-designed architecture when coupled with the game's use of light and colour makes the zones in the expansion nothing short of breathtaking. It can be frustrating at the beginning without the abilities making traversing the land much more possible. Oh, for God's sake, Gizmo. But once I unlocked a few masteries to assist in travel, I couldn't help but just wander the zones, exploring the deep and often beautiful looking environments this expansion has to offer. It is a testament to the developer's art and design department that they've been able to make a jungle zone look this varied and aesthetically exceptional, while hitting the mark on the feeling of being overwhelmed by nature. As much as I personally enjoyed the zones of Heart of Thorns, I can see why for some they can be quite frustrating, however. For those that get less out of simply exploring, having so many flaws within the zone, as well as the design itself, could lead to those just simply wanting to get from A to B, banging their heads against the incredibly intricate design of the expansion zones, frequently not knowing how to reach their destination or if an ability is required. Heart of Thorns also brings with it the Adventures system, yet another activity to get involved in whilst working through the expansion's content. Adventures are self-contained challenges that have three tiers of rewards to achieve, and will task the player with a highly varied set of activities, while playing as some horrible anthropomorphic toadstool nonsense to straight-up shooting galleries. The Adventures in Heart of Thorns go even further to strengthen the MMO's feeling of fun, which is something I could hardly not notice even during my time with the base game. This thing walks a very fine line between cute and creepy, not unlike someone else I know. Being able to break up the somewhat grindy feeling of obtaining masteries for progression with content that feels like it was created to be just that, taking a break doing something totally focused on maximizing enjoyability. With multiple masteries unlocked, and a thorough introduction to the dangers of the jungle, ah, what the teleporting nonsense is this? I was invited to take part in Guild Wars 2's Fractals of the Mist content, Fractals being five-man dungeon-focused opportunities to team up and take on one of the game's 100 tiers it has to offer, acting quite similar to World of Warcraft's Mythic Plus system, with each Fractal having a set of attributes applied to its playthrough for increased challenges, these working alongside the Agony system, Agony being a unique debuff present in Fractals that will damage players and reduce healing when encountered, leading to require players to infuse their gear with special infusions to reduce its effect that grow stronger the higher up in difficulty the Fractals themselves become. Being one of the cornerstones of Guild Wars 2's endgame, I had a great time playing through my first experience, and clearly wasn't alone in my excitement. And I can see why Fractals can provide a massive amount of content for players looking to push up the difficulty, and with it the rewards given, with there even being a storyline provided within the instance to place them within the game's world. With a break from the action getting slapped about in Fractals, we return to the main event, getting slapped about in the jungle where Gizmo delves deeper into the thickets, unlocking more modes of transportation, reaching some incredible heights, and getting a look at some more of the expansion's exceptional looking sites, making sure to now and again track down some of the game's hero points to further progress the Reaper's subclass, unlocking further modes of necromancer destruction. The hero points in Heart of Thorns, in my experience at least, have had a reasonable bump up in difficulty, 
and yes, can cause some frustration. Spending ages finally tracking a point down in the sometimes confusing layout of the jungle just to find out it's far too challenging to face alone. But as far as I'm concerned, just gives another challenge to rise to, as well as encouraging grouping up to overcome the odds. Hero points give 10 points in Heart of Thorns over the base game single point, which is a massive help in achieving a fully unlocked subclass, and makes sense to fully realize the power of the subclass that were in their first iteration brought to the table upon the expansion's release. After the epic conclusion of the Heart of Thorns story, and Gizmo keeping up his tradition of dramatic entrances, Hello everyone. I can say that for those with more of a focus on story-driven MMO content, Heart of Thorns will provide that well, at the same time as being possibly on the shorter side for some. A strong recommendation for those looking for a full story experience would be to look at the purchasable additional episodes of The Living World, covering the plotlines in between the base game and the expansion itself, as after playing through it all contains some really key moments within the story that I expect would leave those that have not progressed through it a little confused at some of the events during the introduction of Heart of Thorns. The choice to paywall such key plot-related developments I'm sure will justifiably rub some the wrong way, as other free-to-play MMOs manage just fine operating with a sole focus on microtransactions that don't hold so much value for those looking to follow something as integral as the game's plotline, and it'll be up to you if playing through all the story will be worth the extra investment. With yet another towering antagonist decimated by our disco hero, it's on to the expansion's raid content, and after teaming up with the great guys and gals over at the Treasure Mushroom Guild, got a chance to take on Heart of Thorns raid instances with the Forsaken Thicket, which as with my previous look into Guild Wars 2's raid offerings, was highly enjoyable, with some interesting mechanics and some tough boss encounters to take on within the raid's three wings. Challenge mode is available within the raid instance to further increase its difficulty along with its rewards. For those looking to take on some of Guild Wars 2's toughest PvE encounters, raids even feature their own mastery skill line to unlock additional buffs and utilities to work towards and to help reach the heights of the higher difficulties. And I hope ArenaNet looks to add more raid encounters in the future alongside those featured in the Heart of Thorns and Path of Fire expansions, as they have already for me at least shown themselves capable of providing a great raiding experience, one that I feel I'll be likely to return to in the future which is a feeling I get a fair amount from content offered by the game's first expansion, with such a variety of activities packed into its zones. The adventures to complete, visitors to reach, and even optional bonus achievements baked into the main storyline. As a package, for those inclined, there is a huge amount to get stuck into, and a sickening amount for any of you poor completionists out there. My experience working through Guild Wars 2's first expansion has served to only strengthen the sentiment of our previous outing within the game's core levels from 1 to 80. What ArenaNet have crafted within the Heart of Thorn zones can feel like a grind getting all the required mastery abilities unlocked, become all too confusing while trying to figure out which area of such a densely packed map your next visitor or activity choice is, and sometimes give the feeling of not knowing where to start. But what Heart of Thorns also gives its players is a chance to dive into yet another experience overflowing with content and entertaining activities to get involved in, whilst battling against the elements in one of the most visually breathtaking and incredibly well-presented MMO offerings around, even seven years after its initial release. I don't feel like I'm running around a reskin of the base game, ticking boxes until another cinematic plays. Heart of Thorns felt like another experience entirely, lost within its unforgiving jungle, oppressed by its inhabitants and overgrown chaos, which as far as I'm concerned, is exactly what exploring a land overtaken by an evil jungle dragon should feel like. I can see why such a chaotic landscape can enthrall some and infuriate others, but for me at least I really enjoyed rising to the challenges presented by Heart of Thorns. But for now, I will settle for diving back into the depths of the jungle, as me and Gizmo have a score to settle with a certain pack of tiny dinosaurs. With the events of the previous expansion Heart of Thorns in the rearview mirror, the Path of Fire experience begins once again via the game's Living World season content. Season 3 of The Living World this time around has cranked the content and experience provided to players up to 11. With multiple massive exclusive zones, these zones are grand in scale and feature rich with event and quest opportunities, including unique currencies to collect for a chance to purchase gear upgrades, while meeting the interesting and sometimes nightmare-inducing local population. The content for Season 3 of The Living World has clearly had just as much love and attention poured into it as the base game and expansion experience. Unique masteries can be obtained, the open world heart quests make a very welcome return, and ArenaNet has even thrown in some keyboard crushing jumping puzzles to keep players reaching new heights while exploring Season 3's zones, along with working through the story to set up the main event. And it's to that main event we go, but first making a quick stop to outfit our pint-sized hero with some new threads for his upcoming adventure, using the game's wardrobe feature to select a look out of the many tempting options. Oh 
shit. With a truly heroic look confirmed, we begin our journey by airship to the harsh desert lands of the Path of Fire expansion, and after working through the introductory mission, beginning our exploration in Amnoon in the Crystal Desert, to report in with the team and meet some of the locals. After progressing through the early story missions, we are let loose upon the new open world, and what is clear from the offset is just how contrasting Path of Fire zones are from the previous outing in Heart of Thorns. In place of the cramped jungle are huge expansive landscapes, with rolling hills of sand coupled with stylized desert settlements tucked in within its cliffsides. ArenaNet once again taking a typically simplistic feeling setting and expanding upon it with a wide range of interesting landmarks and alternative color palettes to breathe character into its barren desert environments. Another element that's noticeable is the bump up in texture quality in the Path of Fire zones, its landscapes feeling far more up to date visually than many previously, especially within the base game and with Guild Wars 2's soundtrack once again providing a beautiful accompaniment to exploring its world, being a blend of base game, exclusive tracks from the expansion, as well as even callbacks to the original game's Nightfall soundtrack. Whilst Gizmo worked his way through the main storyline, one of the biggest features of Path of Fire is provided to the player, interweaved into the story. That of course being the six mounts that the expansion offers to unlock, and as with a fair amount of features offered with this MMO, the mounts are not without their unique elements adding to the experience, with each not only having their own set of skills, but also a mastery tree to allow unlocking even more utility for each. The raptor's leap ability can be upgraded to shoot across large canyons, the skimmer can tread water as well as the area's quicksand to access previously inaccessible areas, and the springer can launch players into the air making not only the exploration easier, but also unlocking a whole range of activities hidden away in the zone's higher regions. The game encouraging players to experiment with the toolset provided with the mounts to reach some of its sometimes insanely placed visitors and mastery points, with some titles getting access to highly effective modes of transportation can take away from getting to know the environments well, and it's great to see Path of Fire adding elements into the mix to instead turn the mount system into something even more effective at doing so. Gizmo immediately turned to seeking out the true power of his newly acquired companions, and when it comes to fully unlocking the masteries for the mounts, players again have a wide range of activities to choose from for effective leveling. Zone events from light to bombastic litter the lands once more, telling tales of the local citizens as well as some of the lore around the dwellers of the desert. As previously mentioned, the Heart Open World quests make a return, and are repeatable daily for even more experience gains, as well as the adventure system continuing from the previous expansion this time centered around quick-fire fun activities with a focus on mounted challenges to get involved in alongside seeking out mastery points. Oh god, that's so embarrassing. Excuse me, do you have a moment? Oh, for you? No, I don't have a moment. Where Path of Fire expands upon the formula is with its bounty system. Bounties can be obtained from bounty boards in each zone, and feature tracking down champion and legendary tiered enemy marks, with a pair of randomly selected unstable magic abilities, making for outings even taking on the same foe, potentially feeling like a somewhat fresh feeling experience. And with each zone having between 12 and 24 bounties available, it's yet another instance of Guild Wars 2 implementing a feature that feels worked through and worthwhile. There are even bounties specifically available for guild groups to band up and take on the challenges as a team. It goes without saying that seeking out to gather enough XP for the Mount Masteries in Path of Fire comes with it a huge variety of options to do so, and unlike on occasion with Heart of Thorns, I would assign a mastery at the beginning of my session, then dive into everything going on in the world, and get so caught up in the action that I would sometimes forget that I was even jumping in to grind them out. And while we're on the subject, it was great to see the mastery points themselves also featuring some creative gameplay experiences. Alongside the more standard reaching a point in the game's world, also having more novel challenges, such as Gizmo being recruited to help out a local chef with his cooking. This is a good time to add in some coconut milk. So fetch me some coconuts! Oh hell no! Partially sighted chefs aside, let me know if you enjoy the video and possibly would like to see a final installment covering the new expansion End of Dragons by dropping a like on the video. Make sure to subscribe for oh so much more RPG greatness, as it really helps keep the content coming. Without drifting into spoiler territory, the story in Path of Fire felt exceptionally well told this time around, not only featuring some great set pieces and a compelling cast, but also with the variety offered when playing through the story missions themselves. I was even tasked with leading a small group of troop NPCs around in one mission, ordering them around as if in one of the Overlord series of games. A number of great looking instances keeping things fresh feeling, and even a ghostly instance recapping the pre-expansion events helping those that may have overlooked the additional content in the Living World Seasons to keep up with the unfolding narrative. Okay, that is genuinely disturbing. 
I stand corrected. I'm not saying that Heart of Thorn's story was poor, but Path of Fire for me felt longer and better put together overall, and definitely made it challenging to hit that pause button on its conclusion to work on this video. As anyone who has experienced it will know, gives more than enough incentive to continue on to Season 4. Which if anyone is interested, I will be streaming both here on YouTube and on Twitch, and it would be cool to have you along for the ride. With Gizmo now in possession of a number of kitted out companions, and with the story so far concluded, it was time to jump into Path of Fire's raiding content, which due to the nature of the plotline had its own self-contained narrative, and once again was highly enjoyable. Utilizing the newly acquired Mount Masteries and injecting them directly into the gameplay while working through the raid wings was great fun. Complex fights with multiple mechanics to wrap your head around, and I was glad to see the surprisingly engaging experience raiding in the previous expansion being carried over to Path of Fire, while adding some spice into the mix to give it a spin relevant to the expansion that provided it. Raiding it has to be said due to the horizontal progression of Guild Wars 2 does for me at least feel less rewarding working through the raid bosses, due to them almost never dropping anything of significant value gear-wise. But with the choice to go with such a model for gearing does come with it the ability for any player with a decent build to be able to jump into all of the game's available modes and challenges, without worry that they'll be at a significant loss when teaming up with others for content. With the fall of a number of the land's toughest adversaries, a collection of bounties in the bag, and a whole host of new companions at his side, Gizmo looked at the next opportunity, and after delving into the deepest depths of Path of Fire, and reaching some dizzying heights, finally got a real look at the majestic beauty of the desert landscape. Yet another addition to the roster of this expansion is Guild Wars 2's first flying mounts. The Griffin can be obtained after completing a number of collections for each zone, featuring tasks ranging from questing out in the world, taking out bounty targets, to more challenging exploration, and in my opinion it's the perfect swan song for the Path of Fire expansion. Taking the player to each zone and tasking them with putting together all they have acquired in their time in the desert to obtain one hell of a reward. Of course, also featuring its own mastery line of skills, the Griffins, along with all Path of Fire mounts, can be used in the other zones of Guild Wars 2. And the Griffin, at least for now, has been set up to not completely remove the need to use your head while exploring the game's world, as acts more of an advanced glider than a traditional flying mount. The Griffin cannot fly directly upwards, instead using dive bombs and single flaps of its wings on cooldown while in flight, and is a massive leg up but also retaining the albeit reduced challenge of reaching tough hero points and other collectibles. My time adventuring through Path of Fire with old Gizmo here has for me been an unbelievable experience. Everyone has preferences when it comes to what they consider worthwhile content, but ArenaNet with Path of Fire added features and built upon others that if done by some other developers would be split across two or three separate expansions. I said it in my first video of the series, and I will again, as it's even more profound for me now. But the ability to continuously add so much flushed out and worthwhile feeling content in this game is unbelievable. Do you want mounts? Okay, have six unique types all with skill sets that we will build into almost all of the other content available in the expansion. Do you want bounties? Here, have a ridiculous amount all with constantly changing parameters to keep things interesting, even once you've finished them all. Oh, and we'll throw in a new spec for every single class while we're at it. Say what you want about where the game is, and people may call me sycophantic, but what I am so impressed by is so little of this game feels like it was added just for the sake of having it. And as far as I'm concerned, whenever I see that kind of passion being put in by a developer, I'm gonna highlight it, as it's one of the keystones that keeps our experience as players at the forefront of game design. Path of Fire for me is one of the best MMO expansions I have ever played. Adding in new and exciting features while making the tried and true experiences all the better to get involved in, all wrapped up in a narrative that just keeps surprising me. If you're a fan of open world MMOs and you're yet to experience Path of Fire or Guild Wars 2 in general, then consider giving it a look. As for me, this one will go down without a shadow of a doubt as one of the greats. 
With such an incredible act to follow, it was finally time to move into the game's most recent content. Building up to the 2022 released End of Dragons expansion, with the conclusion of Path of Fire's story leading straight into the Living World Season 4 and Ice Boot Saga, with both again featuring an insane amount of content. There's a whole lot to talk about here, and I'll be making a return to the Living World content a little later in the video. But another dark entity unfurls its wings across the land. So with no time to lose, we make the journey via the introductory mission to the Land of Cantha, which safe to say doesn't exactly go to plan. That is one fucked up Pokemon. After putting some of the locals' minds to rest for now, we get a look at the absolutely stunning looking landscapes of the early expansion zones. Guild Wars 2 yet again showcasing a masterful use of color and creativity in its zone design, with some of the best looking visuals to date. And of course featuring plenty of events and activities to get involved in while working through the story to the delight of most of its player base. The words of Burning Toilet actually being quite an apt bit of foreshadowing, as for some reason looks to be in Gizmo's near future, judging by his face while getting a chance to take to the seas with one of the local inhabitants. After getting a look around the Xingjie Monastery and progressing through the core plotline, we head over to the Zone's training area, which serves not only as a useful place for new players hopping straight into the new expansion to get a grip of the basics of combat, but also provides a nice buff to experience game for a number of hours after completion, a perfect addition to grab before further exploring into End of Dragons. As for the content itself on offer, the lands are again filled with events ranging from small-scale quick quests to absolutely massive battles, requiring an army of players to complete. Hero and mastery points are strewn around the land once more to assist players in diving into the new mastery lines as well as the new elite specializations unlocked for each class with the expansion. And without drifting into spoiler territory, the plotline is as gripping and humorous as players of the previous content have grown accustomed to. Surprised? Not in the least. How do we find her? You can track them using the ship transponders. Also, hello, I'm still trapped out here. Adventuring further into this new world, it's not long before we're tasked with acquiring our own mode of transport across the seas, with a short introductory mission explaining the basics before unlocking Gizmo's own skipper, a new feature for the expansion to not only allow for enjoying another newly obtainable skill of fishing, but also a great way to travel across the expansion, but for me at least took a bit of time to get used to it, while displaying the locals' clear overestimation of Gizmo's seafaring abilities. Two seconds later. Ah! Oh god, your majesty, I'm so sorry. It's fine, it's fine. Leave it with me, I'll sort everything out. Just don't look behind you. With a number of new masteries to progress and a new mode of transportation, Gizmo headed further inland to the grand city of New Kainane. A beautiful location which for me is one of the most impressive large settlements in the game. Incredibly stylized and well constructed, but also feeling a lot more alive and lived in than some of the previous cities in the game. And a perfect place for Gizmo to get his noodle on. It's in New Kainang while further progressing through the story that we get our hands on yet another interesting feature introduced with End of Dragons. That being the Jade Bot Mastery, a highly useful robot companion that can be used for a whole range of utility abilities, including granting access to use the land's zip lines, creating a personal waypoint for fast traveling, and even boosting the player higher while gliding. Jade bots can also be upgraded with modules to allow for further buffs and bonuses, like hunting down a particular material, recycling items, and adding bonus power to the bot's core abilities. Sliding through the remainder of the expansion story, it's clear to see a focus on bringing a more cinematic feel to the game's narrative, with some incredible performances coupled with epic feeling cutscenes to tell the expansion's tales. And for the story lovers, ArenaNet have done well at rounding up the saga, with a well-told narrative that I'm sure will satisfy those that have played through it in its entirety. The one thing that did stand out a little for me this time around, however, were a number of visual and infrequently gizmo-snaring bugs still present within the game, which in a way is to be more expected given its recent release. Although I feel this one is more likely due to the trauma of being in a boat with gizmo at the helm than anything else. <laughs> gizmo broke the NPC. Oh. Some people don't have sea legs, this woman just doesn't have legs at all. Nothing too major and serves more of a point of just how smooth the ride has felt up until this expansion than anything to worry about.
With the story concluded, Gizmo once again looked to challenge himself against what the game had to offer in its more end-game focused activities. And with that got a chance to dive into my first strike missions. 10 player instance encounters, taking on engagements with two modes of difficulty on offer with the game's challenge mode. Strikes looking to replace the previous raid style content featured in the previous two expansions with quick fire encounters to overcome for a whole range of loot and achievements, and giving those players looking to team up and take on some punishing PvE content even more to get their teeth stuck into. The decision to base the strikes on already featured fights from the story driven content allows for going back through the entirety of the game to create more for players, while lacking the originality of having a dedicated standalone experience such as those featured in the previous expansions, an experience that raiders from other MMOs may be more accustomed to, and for me at least, preferable. Where End of Dragons and frankly Guild Wars 2 in general more than makes up for this is in its meta events. When getting the chance to jump into the Dragon's End meta event, I was utterly blown away with just how insanely epic and entertaining these open world events can be. And that's coming from someone who didn't exactly shy away from the massive meta events already offered in previous expansions. The meta events in End of Dragons are simply some of the expansions and the game's best content for me, and reminded me why this MMO can be such a joy to inhabit. Calmly fishing in the middle of an ocean one minute, only to find yourself tussling with a massive underwater leviathan the next. End of Dragons feels like the developers know where the game really shines, and so look to provide an up-to-date and flushed out feeling experience of that gameplay, and as far as I'm concerned does really well. The masteries, although not feeling quite as game-changing as the previous expansion Path of Fire's Army of Mounts, do a lot to grant quality of life improvements, while giving the player some new gadgets and other utility to enhance their gameplay. And even the mounts themselves, when using the glider boost alongside some of the flying mounts already present in the game. And while I'm on the subject, I want to address something that I said in our last outing when saying this. And the Griffin, at least for now, has been set up to not completely remove the need to use your head while exploring the game's world, as acts more of an advanced glider than a traditional mount. What I didn't show you in the video are the scenes that transpired shortly after uttering those words, than a traditional mount. Oh my god! What the hell is that? Jesus Christ! may have been wrong about that. End of Dragons also provides an addition to the roster of mounts with the new Siege Turtle. Acquiring this mount is once again attached to a series of collections and achievements, which takes the player on a tour of the new expansion zones and content. And I have to say that I love this method, as requires a wide range of alternative content types for completion, whilst pointing players to experiences that they may not yet have had with their time of the expansion. Raising your turtle mount from an egg all the way to its combat-ready adulthood is fun in itself, whilst providing an excellent reward. With the launch of End of Dragons, ArenaNet also provided the players with yet another elite specialization to get stuck into. With Gizmo here, for example, getting a swing at being a necromancer gunslinger. The game now giving players three interchangeable specs per class not only keeps things fresh and allows for new modes and possibly roles of gameplay, but also working very well with the game's legendaries that allow for swapping out of stats that would go very well from switching from a power spec to a condition damage type for example, being able to do both on the fly. At the beginning of this journey into Guild Wars 2, I have to say that I had no idea just how enjoyable and rewarding the experience would be. What started as a deep dive into the core game with a pint-sized hero has grown into a journey across the entirety of the game's plotline and all of the available content. Getting a look at what has kept this now over 10 year old MMORPG, not only housing a thriving player base, but also what keeps it as one of the top offerings in the genre. And for me, End of Dragons was a great summary of those core features. The open world being filled with so many opportunities to get involved in content that range from chilled to insanely intense. A world that feels rich with character and new and exciting heights to reach. My time with Guild Wars 2 as a whole quite frankly caught me completely by surprise with how enjoyable it's been. Covering both the core game and expansions in these videos, as well as streaming the living world together with some of you, which has been an incredible experience. For those looking to play the game, I would strongly advise taking a look at the living world seasons, as within some of those content packs is an MMORPG experience that for me is some of the best Guild Wars 2 has to offer. A multitude of added zones, gear, and additional masteries, along with a storyline that's on par with the best storytellers in the genre, 
and for me the game wouldn't be nearly the same without them. At the end of this journey across the land with our disco enthusiast at the helm, I can't help but look back fondly on the adventure. I said it in the first of the series, Kill Wars 2 will not be for everyone, but if you're a fan of the genre, and now with the Steam release, there has never been a better time to jump into the world that could be filled with so much of what you're looking for in an MMO. But with my experience as an outsider, do you know what a massive component of just how enjoyable this game is? It's the players. The community for this game is exceptional, both within the game and its wider community. As a content creator, I would just like to say a huge thank you to each and every one of you. For those that joined me in battle, that laughed when I inevitably made an ass of myself, and for those that just took the time to join me in this journey. And as we look to what might be coming over the horizon next, I want to raise a glass to you all for providing me with an experience that I will never forget. Thank you so much for watching. This journey has been amazing and I'm keen to get your thoughts down in the comments. I want to give a big shout out to the channel members who help in supporting the channel. If you're interested in joining the channel as a member for all sorts of perks and exclusive videos, the info is down in the description. Thanks again and I'll see you guys in the next one.